happening is a lady that knows no, uh, no, she really needs no introduction because she's our most visited speaker here at the Divine Mercy Conference in our history in our 26 years, an accomplished scripture scholar, author, director, conference speaker. So please put your hands together for Francis Hogan. I want to ask the question, what are we saying? What are we looking for when we say the words, have mercy on us and on the whole world? Jesus told a parable <clears throat> about a man who went into the temple and he bent down to the ground and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This was before Jesus died, so it was before redemption. He was a public sinner, everybody knew he was a baddie. So when he bent to the ground, he was saying, God, give me mercy. God, give me forgiveness. Okay. You and I can't be saying the same thing because mercy is freely available to us and the tribunal of mercy is available to us permanently. You can go to God anytime and get forgiveness. So that can't be what we're saying. Um, just to give you a little smile to start us off, uh, Irish people love saying, oh God be merciful to me, you know I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. But if you accuse them of sin, they'd kill you dead. <laughs> so they don't actually mean that I'm a sinner in that sense, okay. They, they're saying it in some other sense. So if they're saying it this way, well I'm weak and will you give me a bit of slack? I don't think he would put, have put that into the Divine Mercy Chaplet, do you think so? No, I don't think so. Are we saying, let me off the hook? Because if we are, we're just heading straight for purgatory for a long, long journey there. Because you either deal with the fallout of sin now or then, whichever you like. So we can't be saying that either, can we? So what are we saying? Because we're saying two things that because of the passion and death of Jesus, because of the unbelievable price that he paid for our redemption, we're asking for mercy for us and for the whole world. And that's two entirely different things in my opinion. Okay, so let's begin at the beginning. First of all, when we are contemplating God, all of God's attributes are equal. His mercy is equal to his justice, is equal to his wisdom, his glory, his power, his dominion, absolutely everything is equal. So mercy equals justice and justice equals mercy. Same person. Okay. So let's look at one aspect of God that we need to look at if we're dealing with mercy. And that is that God is holy beyond our capacity to grasp. God is purer than light. God is holier than we could ever find words in any language or all languages to describe. He is so holy that that is our problem. Because we are a fallen race. Yes, we're redeemed and you can have as much redemption as you want. But so many people have rejected redemption today. They're outside of it because they've put themselves outside of it. So I want to look at this holiness for a minute. The prophet Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 says, The Lord is of purer eyes than to behold evil. He cannot look at iniquity. And yet the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verse 3 says that the Lord's eyes see everything good and evil. So if he is so holy that he cannot tolerate evil and yet he sees it, he sees everything that's going on, then we have a problem. The second problem we have is given to us in Psalm 139. Uh, where can I go from his spirit? Where can I flee from his face? If I go to the heavens, he's there. If I go into the depths of the sea, he is there. Even if I go into darkness, darkness is not dark to him. So 
I cannot get away from him, and yet he is so pure, he cannot tolerate evil. Do you see the problem I'm setting up for you? God's holiness will not tolerate evil. So how is he going to deal with us? And how are we going to deal with him? Okay? He knows my thoughts before I think them. He knows my words before I say them. That's Psalm 139 as well. Other parts of the scriptures are very clear about God's holiness as well. This is Psalm 22, verse 3. But you are holy. You are enthroned on the praises of Israel. Psalm 99, verse 9. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. And in the holiest prayer that we have, the Our Father, it begins with, Father in heaven, holy is your name. Holy is your name. So, where does mercy deal with this holiness? This is the delicate thing that we've actually got to deal with. Uh, and so I'm going to go back and forth from the time of Christ to now so that you will apply what happened then to what's happening now. And you'll be amazed at the message that's there. First of all, when the divine word leaped from the throne of God into the earth in the incarnation, divine mercy left the throne of God and visited the earth in person because Jesus is divine mercy. Jesus is divine mercy in his own person. When you look at him in his public ministry, you find that he deliberately went to visit people in spiritual trouble. He went looking for sinners, but he did not condone their sin. This is one of the mistakes that's being made in Ireland today. He did not condone their sin. Instead of that, he reached out to them with extraordinary love. He healed them. And when they experienced physical healing from him, they knew that God loved them in spite of their sins. And so they could begin to hear him. And he brought them back onto the road to holiness. So he took them out of the camp of sinners, if I can put it that way, and turned them towards the camp of the saints. And these people who experienced these miracles from him are the very ones who became his witnesses and his martyrs later on. Now this is a headline for us. We're inclined to have healing services for ourselves so that the healings are given to us the pointer is in the wrong direction. If we went out, all of us, and gave the healing to the people out in the country who no longer believe in the Lord, who no longer walk in his ways, if we went out to them and in sheer love laid hands on them so that they would be healed of their problems, then they would know that God loved them and they would be able to come back. We've made a mistake we've turned the graces towards ourselves. Jesus gave the healings to them and so they could come back. And so as a consequence of his approach, these people were able to come back to him. Okay. But at the same time that individuals came back to Jesus, the nation of Israel actually rejected him. So I want you to hear that because this is happening in Ireland today as well. Individuals are seeking the Lord. The nation is walking away. And when you ask for mercy, it's a different thing for the individuals who are turning to the Lord and the nation that is actually walking away. It's actually different. So we have to look at it. Um, in spite of Israel's complete rejection of its Messiah, this little band of people who had been blessed and healed and changed by the Lord, they went out into the Roman Empire to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, in spite of everything, against all the odds. They seemed to be all the wrong people, and yet they did it. And not only that, but they actually laid down their lives for Christ in their thousands. 
and they wrote in blood, I love you, Jesus. It's very easy to say it in words. To say it in action is a different matter altogether. So, St. <clears throat> Peter suddenly discovered something, and you'll find it in Acts chapter 10, when the house of Cornelius was taken into the church, the first Gentiles taken into the church. He said, I've now come to realize that God chose no partiality at all because Israel used to be the favored nation. And they were number one in absolutely everything. And this was Peter, he was a Jew, and he said, now I realize that anybody of any nationality, anywhere, anytime, can turn to the Lord and receive his mercy. Anybody. That was the good news they took out to the ends of the earth. Now, let's jump to 2017 for a, so a minute. Let's come to Ireland. Ireland has had the gospel for 1,500 years approximately. It's a bit more. I'm just rounding. And we've had a long history with Christianity. We've known the Redeemer. We've loved him. We've taken his gospel to the ends of the earth. We became known as a missionary country. We used to be known as an island of saints and scholars. That was then. What's happening now? The strange thing is that in the 20th century, when we uh, came to have our independence, we began to go a different route. We began to go towards the world. We began to go away from Christianity. We began to reject our roots. It's not good to reject your roots. So I'm setting up a problem that needs to be looked at. But in the meantime, this small group of people that had responded to Jesus perfectly and became his disciples, became his witnesses, became his apostles, became his saints, and became his martyrs. What did they experience? What was the mercy that they experienced? Because the word in the Bible for mercy is chesed. You have to pronounce that in the back of your throat. And it means the loving kindness of the heart of our God. I'm going to read for you what it meant for them. And I'm going to suggest that for you and me, when we say, have mercy on us, that this is what we're asking for. And you'll find this in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 3. This then is what I pray, kneeling before the Father, from whom every family, whether spiritual or temporal, takes its name. Out of his infinite glory, may he give you, that is you personally, not just you as a group, may he give you the power through his spirit for your hidden self to grow strong, so that Christ may live in you and in your hearts through faith, and then planted in love and built on love, you will, with all the saints, have the strength to grasp the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, until knowing the love of Christ, which is beyond all rational knowledge, you will be filled with the fullness of God. Now, many of us have read that and thought, yeah, that's for the saints, that's for Faustina, John Paul II, Mother Teresa, and people like that. It wasn't written for them. It was written for every single person who wants to experience the fullness of God's mercy. So it's written personally to you and to me. And I would ask you at the end of this conference to go back to that text and say to the Lord, in fact, if I was in the seat listening to somebody saying this to me, this is what I would say. I'd say, Lord, I'm in. Count me in. Don't leave me out. I want it. Prayer, you know, is very simple. You just have to be clear. I want it. I want that to happen in me. That we would reach the fullness of God. And I'm going to show you at the end of this reflection how terribly important for Ireland that is. Okay? 
And in case you think that, you know, this will happen to other people, but it won't happen to me, St. Paul says, glory be to him whose power working in us can do infinitely more than you could ever ask or imagine. Glory be to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. That's what I understand when we say, have mercy on us, the believers. Now we have to look at what does it mean for and the whole world as well, because the whole world is full of unbelievers. And if you look at the Western world today, it's full of those who absolutely, positively reject Christ. So we have a huge problem. And the problem is this. As a man thinketh, so is he. That's Proverbs 23, 7. You are what you think. And it's the way the world is thinking is the problem. We're inclined to look at the wrong things. We look at their sins or their this or their that and the other. That's not it. The problem is in the way you think. If, there's a very good example uh, of somebody who was behaving badly uh, in the early church. And it was the way he was thinking that was wrong. And this person is Saul of Tarsus. And you find that in Acts chapter 9, this man who thought he was doing God a service by persecuting the early Christians. He really thought he was serving God. Because that's what Jesus said. Those who kill you will think they're doing a holy duty for God. That's in John's Gospel. This man really thought he was doing it. Until a divine light illumined his mind and he realized he was thinking the wrong way. And when he got this new illumination from heaven, this man who persecuted the church became a witness for Christ, became a disciple of Christ, became an apostle for Christ, became a martyr for Christ. What he needed was this divine illumination to help him to think right. That's all. What I'm doing, well I shouldn't say I'm doing it because I asked the Lord to do it. <laughs> What the Lord is trying to do through me is the correct thing, is to tell you that we need to pray properly for the world. To ask God to illumine their minds so that they, their wrong way of thinking is actually corrected. It's a very simple way to pray, isn't it? Because if you look at the massive problems that are in society and in the world, where would you begin? And it's so simple to say, Lord, illuminate their minds. Give them your own light from heaven. Do to them what you did to Saul of Tarsus, so that your world can be your kingdom, and it can be your power that's working, and your glory that's actually illustrated in the world today. So it's the way they think that needs to change. Okay. Now, the people who are going in a wrong direction today are very much guided by what the media are saying and what's av available to them on the internet and all this kind of thing. They're allowing their thinking to be changed by what they're seeing on YouTube or what they're seeing on various websites or what they're hearing from various media. It's the way of thinking that is being affected. And that's what's happening to our young people today who are influenced by this stuff from the time they can walk. At least people my age were spared that until we were 60. And now you have some control, you know, because you knew a different way, you knew a different world. I remember knowing that the presence of the Lord was in the family. I remember that. You too. You probably remember as well. I remember walking into our churches and you could feel the presence of God. It met you at the front door. And that's because the whole congregation knew the Lord and really prayed. And therefore this incredible presence of God was there. If the presence leaves, it means the congregation no longer believes. And it's no longer praying. 
you actually know what to do. So, what happened to the nation of Israel? I told you what happened to the little group that accepted Jesus. But what happened to the nation that rejected him? This is the thing that's terribly important because the whole Western world has rejected Christ and has rejected Christianity and has rejected uh, Christ's way of life, has correct, uh, rejected morality. Okay, so we have to know what is the difference between dealing with those who believe and those who have rejected. It's actually very different. And this is where it's important to remember uh, that what I said at the beginning, that all of God's attributes are equal. So if I put mercy on my left hand and I put justice on my right hand, they're coming from the same person. These two arms are coming from the same person. If the people of God are here in front, it depends on their free will and their free decisions as to whether they go towards mercy or whether they go towards justice. It's entirely our decision. When the people sin grievously, the hand of the clock moves towards justice. When the people turn and do God's will lovingly, obeying the Lord, then the hand goes towards mercy. That's our decision. That's not us blaming God for being hard on us. Not at all. If you take the situation in a family, for example, you have the parents and you have the children. The children who cooperate and will learn and uh, be educated and all the rest of it, they're the ones who receive all the hugs and the affirmation from the parents. The children who rebel and resist and don't want to know and won't cooperate are the ones who experience the discipline from the parents. The parents are not schizophrenic. They're the same people. But they give different responses depending on the decision of the children. And we have been made like God. God is like that as well. That when we as his people move towards uh, doing his will and lovingly serving him, the, the hand moves absolutely towards mercy. When we go in the opposite direction, the hand moves towards discipline. And why must the hand move to towards discipline? And that is to prevent us from losing our eternal salvation. And so the, the reason why chastisement will come to us is simply to put a correction into the system and to uh, warn the people that there are eternal stakes and that if you continue in the way you are, you will destroy your soul. Now the only part of you that's going to live forever until your body is resurrected on the last day is your soul. Okay? And so if the soul is going to live forever, that's the most important part of you and that's the, the area where we've got to actually look at and we've got to take care of. Okay? <clears throat> so if we go back to Israel, at the time of Christ. The nation rejected the Lord completely. On the 7th of April in the year 30 AD, divine mercy opened up in the heart of Jesus and flowed out like the prophet Ezekiel had said from the right hand side of the temple of God because Jesus was the temple and it first of all flowed like a trickle and then got deeper and deeper as it went out into the world and it has filled the whole world. Prophet Ezekiel chapter 37. That's the mercy coming out from the heart of God. The strange thing is it was only a trickle in Jerusalem. Why was that? It's because the nation rejected it, didn't want to know. And it became a huge river out in the other nations of the world. Why was that? Because they accepted it. The Gentiles absolutely said, yes, we think this is a great idea. So for the people of Israel, for the nation, <coughs> excuse me, the hand went towards justice. And when a nation, uh, actually rejects Christ, you need to hear this, because this is why I'm speaking. Uh, <clears throat> when a nation actually rejects Christ, the Lord has to send you the only two teachers you will listen to. Because when a nation rejects Christ, they will not listen to the teachers that God has appointed, namely the leaders of the church. Won't listen to them. 
So what do they do? The Lord sends them the only two teachers they must listen to and they cannot avoid, and they're called sorrow and suffering. Do you know that one in eight people in this country are sitting on trolleys trying to get into a hospital? Our entire nation is sick. Why are we sick? Why aren't we asking the question, why are we sick? Go back to God's mercy and you'll be healed. Go back to redemption and you'll be healed. You'll get the fullness of life. It's the way you're living. You're in the wrong direction. And so God sends us the two teachers, sorrow and suffering, to make sure that we will not lose our eternal salvation. He lets you suffer a little bit in your body for the sake of your soul being saved. Do you think that's a good idea? I don't know whether you said yes or no. It's a bit like a doctor saying to you, look, I'm very sorry, but uh, you're in a bad shape. Uh, we're going to have to do an operation. You won't enjoy it. You'll be uh, months getting over this operation. But if you don't have it, exit. If you do have it, you're going to have a new life. So you don't like the suffering. You don't like all the recuperation or anything else. You don't like all the bills. But you do want the new life. Isn't that it? That's chastisement. That's what the Lord says. Let me give you an operation now and let you recover so that you can come back to me. Okay? The nation of Israel, because they rejected their true Messiah, they accepted all kinds of false messiahs. Because they rejected the Prince of Peace, their state went into absolute chaos. And eventually the heavy hand of Rome came down on them and created a bloodbath in Israel that was unbelievable. And they arrived in Jerusalem for Passover 70 AD, desecrated the temple, destroyed it, killed multiple thousands of the citizens of the, the city, destroyed the city, and in the next 40 years the entire nation was exiled to the rest of the world. Jesus had prophesied, your house will be left empty to you. Your house is your nation and it's also your church. Okay. Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled. So, the extraordinary thing is, after this very, very long exile that they've had since uh, the time of Christ up to the 20th century, the people are of uh, of Israel are now coming back to the Lord and in the 21st century they're coming back in huge numbers and what are they saying Jesus Christ is the Messiah that's what they're saying there's a lot of testimony about that on YouTube if you want to look it up okay so now that we see this what about Ireland in her rejection of the uh, Christianity that was given to us and the long history that we've had. What are we going to do? Since the 1960s and the sexual re uh, revolution that took place, people have gone back into a paganism that's unbelievable. Many of our people have even gone back to Druidism. It's incredible. We've actually joined Europe, not just economically and politically, but we've joined Europe in apostasy, paganism, materialism, atheism, liberalism, rationalism, and modernism, and all the evils that go with it. We're in trouble. And until the Lord gives Ireland a shake-up, that's called a chastisement, whatever it is, until Ireland, until Ireland receives a, a, a shake up from the Lord, she won't remember the one that she risked her life to worship out in the fields and on the mass rocks. But when the sorrow and the suffering comes, she will remember him and she'll go back to the Lord. Now, my, my time is up, but I have to say the next bit is terribly important. Do you mind? Will you tolerate me for another few cents? Thank you. It, it, actually, I'm coming to the most important bit. 
which is that when Jesus came uh, to Israel in the incarnation, there was a small remnant of believers left in Israel. You know their names, Mary, Joseph, Elizabeth, Zachariah, and all the others, okay? You know their names. And even though the whole nation rejected Jesus, God actually was able to do everything he wanted through that little remnant, okay? And the hope for Ireland is this, that there is a remnant, a very holy remnant in Ireland, and it's not small. But just like the remnant that was in Israel, they were unknown to the political and religious leaders. It's the same in Ireland as well, that our holy remnant, and I know a lot of them, and I can tell you they're holy. And it's through them that God is going to bring Ireland to a new era of a new and divine holiness. And they're already preparing. They're preparing in their thousands. It's fantastic. And the, the holy remnant is getting closer and closer to God, while the nation is moving away from God. And this holy remnant carries the seed of the future inside of themselves. It doesn't actually matter what age they are, whether they're young or old, doesn't actually matter. Because in the holy remnant in Israel, there was also all age groups involved. And there will be a persecution of the church in Ireland, I have to tell you that. And there will be martyrs, and many in the Holy Remnant will give their lives to the Lord. They will. And they will lay down their lives in the same way as Jesus did. And they will not only do it the same way as Jesus did, I don't mean they'll be crucified, but that they will lay down their lives in atonement for all that's going on. And I, and I want to finish by giving you this from Isaiah 53, 10. And it said about the Messiah, if he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs and he shall have a long life. And what the Lord wants will be accomplished through him. Okay? So apply that to the body of Christ and the holy remnant that's in Ireland today. And when we, because it's us, offer our lives in atonement, God will, in fact, do everything he had planned. And there will be a, a new future. There will be a holy future. There will be a, a revival of the church in Ireland you couldn't even imagine today. Because we're in, the, we're in the winter of this message. We're not in the spring. But your children and your grandchildren will see the new springtime. Is that good news? Yeah. What the Lord wants me to say to you is persevere and go back to Ephesians chapter 3 and say, Lord, I am claiming that for me. Is that okay? Make sure you claim it for yourself. He will bring you to the fullness. Not because you're great. It's because he's great. <laughs>